Well, good morning, everyone. As, um, as Idello was saying, you know, the end of the year is a, is a good time for reflection, isn't it? Um, in, in all aspects of our lives, but, you know, why not also include our spiritual lives in that as well? A moment of reflection. And, and that's kind of where I want to be headed a little bit this morning and just thinking about your own relationship with God and just to be reflecting on that, thinking about that, especially as we head into the new year. And how we might grow that, foster and cultivate our relationship with God in this coming year. I want you to think about these phrases. Think about these phrases, things like, um, I can't wait to go there. I I love being with them, him or her. You know, I I forget about everything else when I'm with them, right? Right? These are expressions we might um, use when maybe talking about a, a holiday or something where we're heading on, a, on, we're going away for a week soon and, and for weeks we've been like, can't wait to go, can't wait to finally be there and rest or whatever. These might be expressions um, you use when you're with your, your girlfriend or someone you love. I don't know if you've ever been in love, but it's kind of you just forget about all the worries in the world when you're when you're with that, but they, they just disappear when I'm with them. If you ever have been in love, you know, think about those early days. Everything you're willing to do, everything you're willing to sacrifice, if it, if it means just being able to get to spend just a, a little moment with them. See, the, these are good and healthy feelings, right, that, that God has, has placed in us. And to have for a whole sort of a, a variety of things in this life, in this world, the things that are good for us and can be good for us. But then let me ask you a very personal question this morning. And that's where we're headed. I'll ask you a very personal question. When was the last time, those expressions we just used, when was the last time you felt this way or spoke this way about God, where you're like, I can't wait to be with Him. I forget about everything else when I'm with Him. All of the worries in this world, they just they seem to disappear when I'm with my God. Something seems to be missing, actually. I, I feel incomplete when I'm away from Him, and, and therefore I'll sacrifice, I'll do whatever it takes if it means being close to Him just for a moment. There was a period in our marriage, Maru and I, very early on, when, um, when, when we, had to, we were separated while she was um, waiting for her spouse visa to be processed. And they said it could take anywhere from nine months to a year and, um, of her waiting literally on the other side of the world. I think maybe we got to two months, right? It was too much. It hurt too much to be without her. I was incomplete without her. And and it was was a whole body experience. You can't can't eat, you can't sleep. That's how desperate it was. And for those two months, there was nowhere else, literally on the entire planet, that I would have rather have been than in her presence again. You see, Psalm 84, the psalm we're about to look at, is about this very thing. Except that the author feels this way and he talks this way about God. He he most likely, the author of this psalm, most likely he didn't live in Jerusalem and therefore didn't live near the temple. And so he's like, he's, he's going to say through this psalm, there's nowhere else on earth that I would rather be than in the temple with God. And so I want you to pick up on this as we go through this psalm. We feel his longing. We feel his desire. How incomplete he was when he's away from God. And how there's there's nowhere else that he would rather be than in his presence. And so then as we look at this psalm this morning, as we look at it, and as we get a, we're going to get a window into this guy's devotional life into this guy's devotional love for God, 
my hope, my simple hope is that we would all walk away thinking, can I experience God like that? And if I can, that's, I want to. I want to experience God like that. And so this psalm, along with a few practical considerations we'll give at the end, is actually going to show you that you can, we can today. We can experience God the way that the guy in this psalm is. So, so please, if you have a Bible, open up to Psalm 84. And I'm just going to start with the first few verses there. Psalm 84. Let me just get to there myself. And I'm just going to read the first four verses to start with. It's one of my favorite psalms. In fact, we're going to sing a portion of it at the end of the service. Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. As all of you know, um, it's... oh. Flip to the wrong page. But you do still know this anyway. Uh, the fact that probably the psalmist here, um, he's talking from a perspective of someone who may or may not have lived in Jerusalem, but at least someone who had been there. He had definitely visited Jerusalem. And within Jerusalem, the temple, he describes, I don't know if you picked up on some of the vocab there, he describes the dwelling place of God, the courts of the Lord, the house of God. See, here's the thing about that and why that's important for the Jews. The, the, Jew, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, the, the chosen people of God, the temple was for them the most sacred place on earth. Kind of like, I don't know if any other religions come to mind and, and certain pilgrimages that that they will make to, to Saudi Arabia, for example, once a year. It's kind of like Mecca is for the Muslims. To the Jews, the temple was the most sacred place on earth. And we get this vivid picture, this, this wonderful picture in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings. We get this picture of a cloud filling the temple, which was this, this marvelous structure, this building that was built by Solomon. And we get this picture of a cloud filling the temple, and that cloud was, was a, a representation of the glory of God filling the temple. The Jews knew that no man-made structure could contain the glory of God. They knew that. But God thought it reasonable in His goodness, in His gracious, God thought it reasonable to give His people a physical representation of his presence, a, a kind of a symbolic way. God wanted to, because of the promise, I will be your God, you will be my people. He kind of gives them this symbolic way to show them, I am with you and I am among you. And so he, he gives them this cloud, it kind of fills the temple with the glory of God. And so, the, so can you see why the Jews loved going to the temple? And they eagerly look forward to every chance they had to go visit, dwell there, take in its loveliness, <coughs> Excuse me, worship there, sing praises there. Why? why? Why did they find it lovely? Was the building lovely? I'm sure it was. All of the gold-casted ornaments, the, the smells, the perfumes, was it all lovely? I'm sure it was, but that wasn't what made it most lovely. What made it most lovely was that God was there. His presence dwelt there. Which God was He to them? The God who 
chose them to be his people. See, th- this is what's going through their mind every time they're, they're heading to the temple and as they're worshiping. This is the God who chose us to be his people. This is the God who rescued us from Egypt. This is a God who gave us his law. That's how much he loved us. So this is the, all of this is going through their mind. Countless reasons they had, as I'm sure you have. I, I love what Italo just did, kind of opened it up. We, we need to incorporate that more into our services, right? Countless reasons we have, even today, to worship God and, and thank God. That, that's going through their mind as they're in the temple. And so now the impression we get from the author, though, is that perhaps he's now back home writing all this. Perhaps he's back home and he's remembering what it was, it was like to be there. And all he can think of is how, how much he, he, he longs, he faints to be back there. That's why he's like, my soul longs, even faints to be back there. That's how badly I, I just wish I could be back in the presence of God. His whole, whole body experience is going, his whole, even his flesh longs for it. <coughs> it's not COVID, I promise, but can I, can, can I get the water, please? It's just there. <coughs> Sorry. Just working myself up into a frenzy here. I think that's what's going on. What's, what's the picture that came, that came to my mind, at least, as I was thinking about someone where I've seen this kind of longing, right, of, of someone so badly to be back in someone's presence, where even it's the whole, fle- the whole body is involved. I remember um, Maru and I, and may, if you've got kids, maybe this, this happened to you. you, you've done something like this. I remember Maru and I dropping Toby off for the first time at preschool. Maybe you've dropped off, you know, your kids at kindy for the first time. And, and I mean, the expression on, on his face was like, what are you doing to me? I can't believe you're doing this. Why are you leaving me here? And so he's, he's wailing uncontrollably. If I remember correctly, kicking and screaming in that moment. It was a, it was a whole, his flesh was a, it was a whole body experience. And as the teacher is holding him back, right, as we leave, he's reaching out to us. With, with just every fiber in his being, every fiber in his body longing to be back with us. And that's the picture I get of just how desperately the psalmist is longing to be back in the presence of God, where his, it, it, the kind of desire where his soul, his heart, his flesh is involved. Because he, he's remembering how blessed, how happy, how full of inexpressible joy it made him to be that close to God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Have you ever had that kind of experience with God? Have you ever felt that kind of loveliness being in his presence? I think that's the question the psalmist is wanting to raise here. Let's look at the next part. We'll read just the next few verses. Verses five to eight, follow along with me. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are on the highways to Zion. And as they go through the valley of Bacar, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. And they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Not all of us get to live where we'd, where we'd like to live, right? That's just a reality of life, especially when you live in Sydney. Um, I love Mortdale. I love living in Mortdale. I also wouldn't complain if we were able to live in one of those nice, fancy apartments overlooking the harbour. I wouldn't complain. I mean, but we don't always get to live where we want to. And even back then, this was a re- reality for the, the people of God, the Jews, Not everyone back there was able to live in Jerusalem. In fact, probably the majority of the the, the people of God, they were scattered throughout the country in the different towns and villages and the farm, the family farms. 
And so then for these people who didn't live near the temple, you know what they had to do? They had to embark on oftentimes a long journey, a long pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And the picture we get from the part of the psalm we just read is that the journey wasn't always a pleasant one. Right In verse 6, he's talking about the, the pilgrims making their way through the valleys of Bacar. But th- th- this valley of Bacar, it's actually a bit of an enigma. We can't be certain to know what it's talking about. Um, this valley is not on any maps. You won't find it on any maps. There's no other reference to the valley of Bacar in the Bible. And so it's led many to believe that perhaps... The Hebrew word there for Bacar, the, the best translation or, or a good translation could also be affliction or weeping. And if that's the case, if that's the translation of that word, well then it could read like this. As they pass through the valley of affliction and weeping, they make it a valley of springs. And why might their pilgrimage, why might their journey have been one filled with weeping, filled with affliction? Simple answer, because traveling back then wasn't like traveling today, right? I I mentioned we're headed on a a trip up to Port Macquarie and we're going to hop into a car, the air conditioning flowing in our face, the whole, probably even do the standard Macca's stop somewhere near Newcastle, right? What wasn't like that back then. Imagine if we had to do that trip by foot. The, the roads weren't paved like they are today. It was, it was dry, dusty, arid terrain. And then, depending on how far you live from Jerusalem, you probably had to, you know, make camp for a night or two. And and therefore brave the, the weather, maybe even thieves. Don't imagine they had a, a huge variety to choose. You kind of ate what you were given. And yet, here's, this is what I love about this. And yet, for the people of God, longing to be in the presence of their God, not even the most terrible of conditions would stop them from making the journey. Why? Because we're told that they had set their hearts on pilgrimage. They'd set their hearts, their sights, their, their, all of their being on the highways to Zion, it says. They determined to go to Jerusalem no matter what. And it was this resolution, right? It was a resolution, I'm going to get into the presence of God no matter what. It was this resolution, knowing who they would find in the temple, sustained them through the valleys. That's what sustained them through the valleys. And get this, as they got closer, the closer and closer, it's, it's almost like it starts to exhilarate them. They're in the valleys, but it seems like it's actually making them stronger. Instead of making them weak and discouraged, did you notice? It says that they go from not strength to weakness, they go from strength to strength. Because it's like they're, they're, inc- they're, they're increasingly filling with this anticipation of being with God. It's just overwhelming. It, I'm in the valleys, but that anticipation is just makes me strong. When was the last time you felt that about God and being in His presence? You know, I wonder if perhaps <clears throat> I just pose the question. I wonder if perhaps many of us are missing out on the blessings to be enjoyed with God. Because we find the journey and the process too hard. Right? First sign of pain, first sign of affliction, first sign of discouragement, I'm out. M- maybe it's because also, and this isn't helping, our generation, right? And I, I, I tell this to, to the kids all the time. Our generation is programming us to need, desire, Instant gratification. We, we need it now. You, you need to get somewhere, click, Uber, easy. I'm hungry, click, menu log. And even now, you need to get to church, just as easy, click YouTube. 
right? Instant church, instant gratification. Whatever happened to really putting in the hard work and even sacrifice at times in order to enjoy the things that you love? See, I think this is what the psalmist is getting at. It's that journey. It's the journey and the afflictions along the way. Doing whatever it it takes to get yourself into the presence of God. He's saying that's part of the blessing as well. The blessing is in the valleys. The blessing is in the journey. The blessing is in the, the weeping and the afflictions. Why? Think about it. Because it's on the journey where God loves to turn weeping into springs of joy, isn't it? It's on the journey where God can showcase His strength in the midst of our weakness. And it follows, it follows then that you need to stay on the course long enough, therefore, in order to enjoy the springs, in order to enjoy the weeping bitterness and affliction turning into joy and springs. You know what comes to mind? I, I couldn't help thinking about this as I was, I was thinking about the journey, the affliction, the weeping and, and not giving up. I think China mentioned this a few weeks ago when, um, when he talked about Jacob and Esau. You remember back in Genesis, we're told that Jacob wrestles with a man and according to Jacob himself, he seems to think that it's God himself that he's wrestling with, right? And we're told that Jacob wrestled with God until the breaking of the day. In other words, however long it took, however long. The point is, he, he wouldn't let go of God. He wouldn't let go. He kept on wrestling. And he tells God, in fact, I will not let you go unless you bless me. See, I don't know if you've ever thought about God in this way. God seems to love a good wrestle, right? God seems to love a good wrestle because why? Think of, I don't know if anyone's like interesting or has ever wrestled anyone before. You know, I, I, used to, I do that with, with the kids all the time. Think of how kind of personal and intimate you get with someone when you're wrestling with them. I've always wanted to start up um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, actually. The only thing stopping me uh, is the idea of having my, my face pressed up against other men and, and in their bits, but uh, that's a whole other issue. The, the point is, Jacob experienced the intimacy of the wrestle, so much so that he is able to say, I have seen God face to face. And so not only does God love a good wrestle, He loves to bless those who won't let go at the first sight of pain. He loves to bless those who won't let go at the first sign of pain. And so that brings us to the last section of the psalm. Let's keep reading verses 9 to 12. Verse 9. Behold our shield, O God, look in the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This last part of the psalm is a bit more familiar to us, right? Especially verse 10. For a day in your courts is, is better than a thousand elsewhere. We're, we're about to sing that in just a moment. But then notice how that part of the verse continues. I would rather be a doorkeeper, he says, in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. I thought that was interesting. It seems that such was his relationship with God. Such was his longing to dwell in the house of God rather than 
<coughs> dwelling in the tents of wickedness, which it kind of seems like he's having to live in, it made him sensitive to his surroundings. Specifically, it seems to have, such was his longing to be in God's presence, it kind of made him sensitive to the evils around him, the, the, the tents of the wickedness, his context, his generation, his culture. When your heart and your soul is so intimately in tune with God, well, then not only will you grow to love the things that God loves, you will also grow to hate the things that God hates. That's, that, that's the full package. And God hates wickedness and evil. And he calls his children to have no part in it. And I love this. Such was his desire to, to not be around that kind of evil and wickedness. It says that he'd, even, he'd be willing to be a doorkeeper. Or as some have said, kind of the idea is like a, a janitor, like a, a cleaner in the temple. In other words, get this. In other words, it's like he's saying, I'd be willing to take whatever job is available. I'd be willing to take whatever job is available if it means that I get to serve in the te- and just be close to the temple. Because being in the temple means being close to God. Imagine we all had this kind of attitude when it came to serving at church, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if we had this, this attitude? I'll take on Whatever role is available out there, whatever role, kids' church, coffee cart, music team. I mean, I may not even love kids or like kids. I've never frothed a jug of milk in my life. I don't even play an instrument, but you know what? I'll give it a crack. I'm willing to learn. Why? If it means being close to God, His temple, His people, if it means I get to serve God, serve his people. And, and, and so just in this, this brief survey of Psalm 84, we've seen the experience, a window into his own devotional life with God. And so just to try to bring it all together, just try to bring it all together, because you may be like, well, that's, that's great for the pilgrim of Psalm 84. That's wonderful. That was his experience, but what about me today? What about me today? What if I just can't relate to his experience? What can I do? What can I do? And so that's you this morning. You you long to have this kind of intimacy with God. Here's just a few practical considerations that might help. They may help. Here's the first one. Simply, you've got to want it. You've got to want it. You've You've got to want to and desire to seek God and find God. You you remember what God says to us all through the prophet Jeremiah? He says this, listen, you will seek me and find me when? When you seek me with 10% of your heart, 50% of your heart, all of your heart, he says. It's almost like a promise that you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. We must never forget, right? Never forget that although God is spirit, we're told that God is spirit. He is a person though. Never forget that. God is a person. He is personal, personal being. He has personhood. And as a person, he wants to be wanted. He wants to be found. And just like with other people, and think about your other relationships, you cannot develop a deep and personal and meaningful relationship in just one encounter. It's not going to happen. It takes work. It takes time. You've got to want it. That's why God says a half-hearted effort. It just won't do. It won't do. It's when you seek Him with all of your heart, that's when you will find Him. And it's not like He's hiding or anything. He's always there, waiting, ready to be found. Perhaps, just a question, perhaps you're not as as close to God as you'd like to be because of all of the competing priorities going on in your life right now. I can only imagine, sorry, I've used her way too much today already, but 
can only imagine how Maru would feel if I told her every Sunday morning, I want to be with you more than, and we, you know, we sing about it every Sunday morning. We, I tell you, but this is, I told her every Sunday morning, I want to be with you more than anything and then spent zero effort seeking her or being with her for the rest of the week. You've got to want it. Here's the second practical thing required for this kind of intimacy with God. Self-examination. We, we, I can't skip over it. It's in the Bible. Self-examination. You may need to this morning, if, if, you're, if this, you're like, oh, that relationship with God, that's foreign to me. Well, maybe this morning you need to examine your heart and to see whether there are any blockers. Maybe there are some blockers there. Is there any sin disobedience blocking you from having a thriving devotional life with God. This is how the psalm puts it actually in verse 11. No good thing does he withhold. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk whichever way feels right to them. No. Those who walk uprightly. Those who walk according to his word. Since the very beginning, you know, this started with our first parents, Adam and Eve. We've seen the effect that sin and guilt and shame has on our relationship with God, right? They went from walking with God to hiding from God. And so this psalm is an, an invitation. It's an appeal to hide no more but instead to receive all of the good things that God loves to give to His children who walk uprightly, who walk with integrity. You might be missing out on this intimacy because there, there are blockers there getting in the way. Thirdly, third practical step towards growing your relationship with God, and this one has to do with trust. This one has to do with trust. Think about, again, our human personal relationships. Where there is no trust, there is no intimacy, right? Where there is no trust, there is no intimacy. The very last line of the psalm says, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Blessed is the man who trusts. You, you know, it's interesting, that word for trust, uh, another way you could put it is to lie down. Like, like when you lie down to rest on, on something. We recently bought some new sofas from Costco, of course. We, we recently bought some new sofas and they, right now, they are our favorite thing to lie down on at the moment. No matter what kind of day we've had, I know that when I lie down on that sofa, I forget about all the worries of the world because I can rest there. And notice, before throwing my full weight on that thing, Okay, thankfully, they're sturdy, these ones. I'm not wondering whether it can hold my weight because I trust it because it's held me up time and time again. And, and I wonder if, if that's kind of a good way to think about God in this psalm. God is like that sofa. And that he's waiting for us to throw our full weight on him. All of us given over to him. And when you can trust Him like that, well, no matter what kind of day you've had, what's the, what's the worst thing that this life can throw at you? Hey, there's, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than in God's presence because that's where you're going to find rest, peace, contentment that you can't find anywhere else. Perhaps you haven't been experiencing this, this kind of intimacy with God because, because there's been a breakdown of trust somewhere along the way. And then finally, this is the last of the practical things. And this one's really important. It's really, really important because especially the guys I've been kind of going through preaching, they're like, you haven't mentioned Jesus. You could have preached this in a sermon, in a, in a mosque or in a, in a synagogue. Right now. Where's Jesus in all of this? This one's really important because you may be thinking, well, I'm ready to see God this way. I, I want to know God the way the guy in this psalm does. But where do I go for that? 
where do I go to the temple, to, to, to Jerusalem, like he did? Is that how I find God? Here's the bad news. Even if we wanted to, the temple that he's talking about, it doesn't even exist anymore. Um, it got destroyed around 70 years after the birth of Christ, 70 AD. And the area where it once stood, that area, as you would know, it now belongs to the Muslims. And so that leaves us with an important question then, doesn't it? How do we as pilgrims today find God and find His courts and find His house so that we might dwell there? Well, here's the good news. The invitation of Psalm 84, that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. The appeal, the invitation. What has developed though? What has developed in God's unfolding plan for us, His people, is that He simply tells us He is now chosen to reveal Himself and His presence no longer in a man-made temple, but now in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. He tells us that himself, right? Like in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews it says that he, talking of Christ, Christ is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. The author of the Hebrews knows that that's going to bring imagery of the cloud that filled the temple. Yeah, he does that intentionally. The glory of God and his ray is now in Christ. It's no longer the cloud that fills the temple because the radiance of God's glory is now seen in the face of Christ. And that's why Jesus could say things like, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's why Jesus could say things like, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, speaking about himself as the new temple. And, and that's why Please get this. Maybe you, you've missed this as you read the resurrection story. That's why when Thomas, remember Thomas, one of the disciples, looking at the resurrected Jesus face to face, you remember what he says? My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And notice Jesus doesn't rebuke him for saying that. This is this is blasphemy coming out of the mouth of Thomas. Okay, they were technically still under Jewish law back. That, that deserved a good stoning. To attribute deity to anyone else other than the God of Israel, and yet Jesus does not rebuke him or correct him. Because Thomas was simply speaking the truth. Because Christ is indeed the God of Israel. And so therefore, here's the practical side to that as it relates to our own devotional life. I don't know if this happens to you or not. It, it's, it's been part of my experience for as long as I can remember. But there are times when, you're, when we're encouraged to seek the presence of God, right? We're told to be in the... But, but that idea can seem kind of a bit abstract. How, what does that mean? What does it look like? How do I do that? Am I supposed to maybe like um, visualize heaven? in my mind, and that takes me into the presence of God? Maybe, um, and I've done this before, like you kind of visualize what would it have been like to actually be in the temple? And maybe your mind goes to, oh, what would it have been like actually to be behind the veil, behind the curtain, and see the cloud? I think there's nothing wrong with that. You know, maybe, maybe your mind, your, your imagination is just wired to do it that way. But what if, on the other hand, what if being in the presence of God and seeing His glory, it doesn't have to be this abstract thing, right? What if seeking God was as simple as opening up your Bible and going to Jesus and fixing your eyes on Jesus and seeing Him in all of His glory through the pages of Scripture, you don't need to hop on a plane and go to Jerusalem. You don't even need to hop in the car and come here to be with God. When you have an open heart and an open Bible, determined to know Christ, to love Christ, to become more like Christ, 
Well, in that moment, you can experience and enjoy everything the psalmist was able to all of those years ago when he actually had to go to the temple. That was a game changer when someone suggested I do that. Get stuck. I don't, God, I, I want you, I want to seek you. Go to Jesus and see the radiance of God's glory in his face. That's why if you know kind of me and my preference and, and my teaching and preaching, I try to make sure we go through some of the gospel every year because that's where we see the glory of God in the pages of Scripture. And you know what else has been a game changer as of late, actually, really has been helpful. And, and maybe you already have this. Set yourself up a little temple somewhere in your home. And I don't mean like a shrine or anything like that, right? But a place that symbolically you associate your devotional life with God with. I mean, it could be anywhere. It could be a, a certain chair, a sofa, a table. For me, it's simply my study, right? But the point is, it's a place you look forward to going to because you know you get to meet God there. We all know that we can be with Jesus, pray to the Father wherever we are. But I do believe that having these kind of physical and symbolic things could really be a useful part of our worship. I mean, God has wired us this way, right? That, that's why, think about it, that's why Jesus tells us when He sets up the Lord's Supper, He says, take this bread, physical, break it, touch it. Take this wine, drink it, feel it going through your body in order to remember Him through communion. So let me just encourage you with those practical steps. Seek Him with all your heart. Confess and turn away from any sin that could be blocking that relationship with God. Trust Him by casting the full weight of your cares and worries upon Him. And then lastly, establish a meeting place with Him. And then, once you've established, come to Him with an open heart, an open Bible, determined, no matter what, in the valleys, determined to know Christ, to love Christ, and to become more like Christ. Let me pray as the music team comes up so we can sing about dwelling in the courts of the Lord.